everyone. Welcome on Let's Talk AI podcast. Super happy to be here today with uh, William. Uh, how are you doing, William? I'm doing fantastic, Thomas. How are you doing, my good sir? Doing very, very well. Um, this is a very uh, special episode to me because uh, uh, for a long time we've been uh, chatting and, and I really wanted to to invite you on the podcast, share about um, AI, but a lot of things. Um, but for the people who might not know you, could you introduce yourself in a few sentences? It can be professionally and personally. Of course, my pleasure. And I want to reciprocate there as well, Thomas, because it's been certainly my pleasure to, to see the podcast grow and you have a long list of illustrious guests. So I'm certainly feeling self-conscious about being included there, but I, I will hopefully do my best to, to bring some some left domain expertise and stuff that's a little bit maybe unusual uh, in terms of in terms of my background. So uh, I was born in Chicago, uh, but really I was raised in Texas. My academic background is pretty varied, having studied chemistry, world literature, but eventually began pivoting towards philosophy. And that has really constituted my graduate studies, uh, both at Case Western Reserve University and at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, professionally, I've worked at numerous tech startups and most recently building a new investment trading platform from scratch. I've been operating as a digital nomad since before the pandemic, which is of course how you and I met Thomas on Grand Canaria, Nomad Capital. Uh, and so I've been reading, writing and coding from dozens of countries, uh, which has of course uh, been, been a, a good picture of my lifestyle over the last few years. That's awesome. Thanks for this um, brief introduction. Uh, like I said, I'm super happy to to have you on the podcast. I have so many questions today. We want to talk about um, AI, AI history. Uh, you have a quite a unique perspective on the subject because of um, your philosophical background, but you also deeply understand the technical part of um, mm, AI in general. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you about um, your vision and what you're trying to achieve in the field as a as an individual. Uh, so can you share a little bit of, um, of what you're trying to achieve today? Of course. So I would say I have a particular perspective on AI, which I will hope to try and persuade you of over the course of the podcast. I would say there's really three core ideas I hope I can convey to you over the course of our conversation today. The, the three being about what is the nature of artificial general intelligence, uh, what is the threat of artificial general intelligence, and what room does AI leave for human creativity and human skills going forward? So those are three perspectives, uh, two of which I think are well represented in the philosophical literature and really come from the field of philosophy of AI, and the third of which is, is more or less what my research has been focused on. Uh, really being that last argument about where does human reasoning fit and how it's different from how AI currently works. That's awesome. I can't wait to go deeper into, onto those uh, three, three subjects. Um, before diving into um, uh, AI, I would like to ask you about um, briefly, if you could take us um, a little retrospective on your career, um, like how you grew, um, how you become today as a CTO of, um, of an investment company, you said before that you um, made it from scratch. So can you give us a retrospective of your career and what you've been doing since now? <laughs> I can. And Thomas knows that this, this is a bit of a can of worms since I've taken a rather unusual journey to the CTO role and uh, have a bit of a surprising background for your typical Texan, which the, the right way to start that is, is I actually spent most of my youth in Texas training as a competitive ice skater. Uh, and so I was there with a bunch of different Russian uh, and Soviet Olympic coaches. And so that gave me a very unique perspective uh, as, a, as a young man growing up in a particularly competitive individual sport, but a sport which is, as you can imagine, not so common in Texas. Uh, that being said, Texas, uh, especially Dallas, which is where I'm from, has produced a lot of strong athletes in ice skating and gymnastics over the last decade or so, a lot of Olympians. And so that was very formative to my worldview, being an athlete, uh, being an individual athlete and seeing how hard work, discipline, uh, and how outcomes often fall 
not along a bell curve, but uh, maybe really many, many things in life are winner take all. And so those were lessons that were carved into me at a very young age. Uh, I would say after that, uh, I was continuing to train for skating and ended up moving up to Cleveland, Ohio for a university. And there's only several, there's really only a handful of, of metropolitan areas in the United States that you can, you can train at a, at a high level in ice skating. And that happened to be one of them. And so I decided to go to university there at Case Western, which is mostly known as an engineering and medical school. And from there, after completing my studies, I moved along to University of Amsterdam, where I continued working in graduate studies in philosophy, again, focusing on philosophy of technology, philosophy of AI. In parallel to that, I always had a professional career building things. To me, philosophy and startups are, are very much related. And if you go looking around the startup ecosystem, you'll find lots of VCs and tech visionaries that have a background in philosophy. Uh, people like Peter Thiel. There's, of course, the famous book by Paul Graham, Hackers and Painters. And so this, this marriage of the humanities and engineering has become more accepted than maybe it used to be, but now it's kind of commonplace. Uh, maybe even most so with generative AI, like Midjourney. So from there, I, I began pivoting towards my, my developing business career. And as any entrepreneur in the 21st century knows, if you can master uh, the skills to build new products yourself, it gives you tremendous leverage. Uh, and so there's nothing more empowering than being able to envision an idea, but knowing you can execute on most ideas that you can envision. Is, is a superpower. That's awesome. Thank you for this um, wonderful retrospective. Indeed, not a very common background, but um, I think it, it also um, showcases um, um, between many of the aspects that you've mentioned, uh, it showcases for the, for the people who are listening that there is no one way to uh, see role and that, uh, and that following patient leads you to to great discovery and, and and you can do crossovers and there is no one path and and I think that's this this is one thing that we can we can see from from your history between many other things that we'll um, uh, come back to uh, right now. Uh, so thanks a lot for um for this uh, retrospective. I would like to ask you now. You mentioned these uh, three main points that we would like to discuss about AI. Discuss discuss sorry. So the first one. I think for the audience, um, it could be very interesting to to have a little bit of a background of AI, like the history of AI. So could you share some, um, like, could you go back on some history of AI for the people who are listening? Absolutely. So I think that will meet nicely with the first general argument. I, I hope that you and your audience will, will hear me out on which is I'm going to argue that artificial intelligence as a field is philosophy. It is nothing more than applied philosophy. And so what I mean by that is when you think about the history of AI, it really begins with a much earlier quest to take what is inside of our mind our means of thinking, our means of perceiving and organizing information, and to externalize it. And that is externalizing it today through something like a non-logical representation in a computer. But that objective of trying to take the means by which we reason and externalize it into some format that we can then use as a tool is as old as recorded human thinking. It is the basis by which we have formal logic, uh, beginning in ancient Greece. Uh, the idea of taking human reasoning and finding formal representations for it, finding ways to write it down and then do operations on it. In the past, we used to record it on maybe papyri or stone clay tablets. Uh, obviously, we get into different kinds of media. Uh, and through most of that time, we were doing a lot of the manipulating of those symbols ourselves. But of course, uh, beginning with times like the Renaissance, we start seeing increasingly 
uh, automated or mechanical means by which we might try and manipulate those symbols, which, which lead directly to things like the creation of the, the modern computer. So where would you like to dive in, Thomas, on maybe specific, sh should we start in the 20th century? I think that would be great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So to be clear, the argument I just made that, that AI is philosophy is one that was articulated also by Daniel Dennett, uh, who's, who's well known as a philosopher of mind, a philosopher of consciousness, wrote a famous book explaining or really arguing that consciousness mm -hmm. was an illusion. Uh, and so he has sort of an, an, an idea that really with the conscious mind, we're, we're simply we're simply seeing the different modules of our cognition at work that creates the illusion of consciousness and, and that really it's, it's quite mechanical. Uh, so that is more or less what you've probably heard his name for Daniel Dennett. Uh, but he has art articulated the same point that, that AI is, is philosophy writ large. So if you look at the 20th century in, in philosophy and, and how it relates to the birth of computer science, uh, as many listeners in your podcast may know, the, the father of the modern computer is often considered to be, of course, Alan Turing, who was deeply interested in not just computer science, which, of course, he invented. Hard to be interested in something that you created uh, until you create it. But he was really a mathematician and a philosopher by training. And so we know of some famous debates he had, for example, with other 20th century philosophers like Ludwig Wittgenstein. And what he was really getting at with mathematical logic uh, was many of the problems in mathematics, which do have a philosophical depth to them. Uh, and so what we really see in the history of AI in the 20th century is after the computer is really articulated in full by people like Turing, Alonzo Church, and John von Neumann, some of the other uh, giants of the early computing revolution, you began seeing more and more people get involved in the idea of trying to take computers and not simply treat them as tools for the mind, uh, but of course, beginning to replicate things more along the lines of artificial life or artificial intelligence. And so by that, they really mean trying to take certain functions or tools of the mind and finding ways to replicate them in a computer. But the birth of AI according to many scholars, is actually with the Turing test. So that's why we can trace it directly back to Alan Turing. In fact, if you pick up many AI textbooks, you would see that some people provide what you would call like a functionalist definition of AI, which is AI is the field that attempts to create machines which defeat the Turing test. <laughs> so they literally use, uh, operationalize that that. Turing test to, to define the field itself. And so, of course, the Turing test is, is really a question of whether or not any human being, when con conversing with a computer, can decipher, distinguish between a computer and a, another person. And so it's, it's a very specific test. It obviously has very direct relationship to the milestones we've seen with ChatGPT. After you have the Turing test, which really gives birth to the quest to defeat it, uh, as all great problems in mathematics do, once you announce the problem, then you set off the race to, to overcome the problem. Uh, you also begin seeing AI start to broaden and flourish in terms of what are other potential uses of software programs to replicate what we would consider maybe human mental effort. So a lot of the very early attempts at AI were focused on trying to do the very same things that Alan Turing was interested in. So do things like complete mathematical proofs or try and recreate early mathematical proofs. So you see the birth of a field that's called logic programming. Mm -hmm. And many early AI programs are targeted at trying to prove things that maybe are Euclidean or Aristotelian in terms of classical logical propositions? And can you write a software program that automates this? And so you see that birth of logic, computer science, and AI, it's really all the same thing at the beginning before these fields diverge 
as, as they grow and, and become fields of deep expertise. Do you have any questions so far? Should I, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I can go on forever, Thomas. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to check me here. Like, <laughs> like everyone, like everyone probably noticed, I was just, um, I was just very, um, very attentive uh, because it's not. Uh, I recently listened to a, an episode of um, of uh, Lex Friedman with um, Sam Altman, the, the CEO of OpenAI, and uh, they were discussing. Um, AI nowadays, and I feel like uh, we don't often um, hear a throwback about what happened of the with the field of AI with uh, that much detailed um, that much details. Uh, so, so I was just um, thinking there are many things to ask uh, about um, about what you just said. Um, I think you mentioned um, a lot of great names and. Um, and uh, you mentioned like the past and what what we're trying to to resolve. Uh, I would like to to have your opinion on jump through time and have your opinion of the state of AI. And you mentioned consciousness, uh, and I would like to to know like two days with the the the, the, the you mentioned the latest mi the latest milestone of uh, chat GPT and we're seeing all those LLM large language models appearing and we're learning how to uh, get the most value out of those and uh, we know that the op community of open source are doing um, great models every day so far like lately they have been super hard to keep up with like the latest model and the latest advancements so where I'm going with that, I think I would like to ask you about um, the field of AI today, um, and uh, and and how how do you see all the latest um, um, advancements and, and milestones um, against the Turing tests? Because you mentioned the Turing test is the base, uh, and and this is what set up. Um, a lot of the problems to be solved, and and today we've uh, we've uh, we have those new models and everything. So yeah, what do you think about uh, the latest milestones um, in the in the storyline of AI, and um, and how do you see the future? Uh, and then I will ask you a bit more about consciousness. <laughs> that sounds good. There was a lot there. Okay, so yeah. di diving into it, I think I think what I needed to do for you here, Thomas, I need to connect the dots between the the old story I just told about the birth of AI to to mm -hmm. what the heck is going on now. We've seen an incredible amount of innovation and what seem like material breakthroughs. So the thing that's really provocative, of course, about what we've seen over the last few years is AI has been around for decades now. Like I was just saying, it's 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 a topic that we've had for. 50, 60, 70 years, depending on how you define the birth of the field. And yet what is happening over the last 10 years or so seems like real phase transitions in the history, real, real periodic moments uh, or, or key events, which are, are not merely incremental changes, but the actual breakthroughs. And I think what you can trace that to is after... AI is born as a field, there's really two directions that you see it go, which define the first period. The first of which is in building something like autonomous agents or robots. People were very interested early on. You, it, what's something that's fascinating culturally is if you go back and look at cartoons and movies from the 60s and 70s, even the 80s, people are obsessed with robots. <laughs> and you see things like Terminator, you see things like the Jetsons are rife with robots everywhere. Uh, there are robots obviously all throughout Star Wars. And so a lot of people working in AI found it to be a field that was very much attached to robotics and autonomous agents that would operate with us uh, and go help us do tasks in everyday life. Interestingly enough, not unlike robotics, uh, AI took a long time to eventually reach a phase of maturity that we thought it was feasible. Obviously, with robotics, we maybe still aren't there in the sense that we don't, while ChatGPT has now become one of the most successful software launches of all time, 
ro there's there's no comparable uh, commonplace acceptance of robots in your everyday life unless you really stretch the term to include certain kinds of devices you might use but not robots in the sense that we imagine in science fiction books so that that's direction one Another direction that you begin to see is people get very focused on expert systems. And so they become very interested in building programs that do things like play chess well. And that turns out to be the more promising avenue, or at least it's the avenue by which we see a lot of AI begin to flourish up until what we would call really like maybe like the very contemporary period. So what Expert systems or rule-based systems are, they are a very special domain in AI. And the way I would conceive of AI, Thomas, and the way I would articulate it, which we'll get to my third point later, is you can break AI down into really three big fields or three big moments. And I think we've been through two. The first of which is AI systems which use deductive reasoning which is, of course, a philosophy term. But all deductive reasoning is, is it means you reason from rules. And so it's an example such as the, the, the most famous and reprinted example of all time is that all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. And so this is actually how people tried to go about programming early AI systems. It was called the logicist approach or sometimes the symbolic AI approach. And the idea is that if you collected all of human knowledge and you were able to codify it into rules, that would be a very large task, but would eventually it would, it would achieve something like an AGI. And of course, that was not something that's very tractable. And so people chose very specific domains to begin trying this idea with. And a classic example turned out to be game playing. So we see the emergence of many people focusing on game playing algorithms, game playing programs. And this is exactly how they begin to do it. They take human expertise and they write complicated rules-based systems that allow machines to use their lack of human error to proceed through a complex set of rules consistently every time. And so that kind of deductive period defines a, a large segment of AI up until the point where you start seeing very successful rules-based systems like uh, the ones that defeat Gary Kasparov, right? And so the, the, chess, the chess playing systems achieve a, a great milestone in AI and being able to finally overcome some segments of human intelligence using rules-based systems. What you're seeing now is a total, total change to an inductive model in AI. The difference between early rules-based systems is, and what you see now is, of course, the, the bloom of machine learning. And machine learning is a completely different approach from the deductive approach of taking rules and then deciding what to do from them. Rather, it's taking many cases to infer rules. And we, this is, again, a, a classic example in philosophy being the famous example being that of crows or ravens or, or black swans is, is one that's been very popular recently, thanks to Taleb, which is you see every swan in your entire lifetime think that all swans are white. And so you infer from every swan you've ever seen that it is a rule that swans must be white until, of course, you encounter a black swan. Uh, one of the interesting things about induction, though, and this has been revealed in things like ChatGPT and other forms of machine learning, is that it is defeasible or non-monotonic. Uh, and those are fancy words to mean that inductive reasoning can be wrong. <laughs> uh, and when we think of deductive reasoning, we often think, OK, we have certain concrete rules we know to be true, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. If this is an equation, which is two things being added together, I know it's got to be 4. And that is not necessarily the case with induction, which is why inductive technologies have things uh, like hallucinations, or, or that's part of the reason why, although it's actually much more complicated than that, of course. But the, the point is, is that it's, it's simply a different paradigm. Uh, so, so what you're seeing happen now is simply we are beginning to realize that we have the technology which emerged through developments in GPUs at NVIDIA. So basically, we were able to we were able to get the the requisite amount 
of processing power and the requisite amount of big data uh, at the moment we're at now to finally achieve very successful inductive programs. So the paradigm shift you're witnessing is we now have the hardware and the data to train systems inductively through machine learning so that they can actually defeat uh, those old rules-based systems in, in many common tasks. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love, um, I don't know about um, the people who are listening, but um, I, I love to have this retrospective um, and, uh, and um, it, it put all things into place. So thanks a lot for, for, uh, for, sharing, uh, for sharing. So from here, I, I have uh, my next question is uh, for you. Um, we talk about um, um, the different types of uh, AI, different paths. Uh, and I would like to, to ask you about how do you compare human reasoning to the the latest, um, not necessarily the latest advancements. I'm not referring directly to, um, um, to for example, ChatGPT, but um, how do you compare AI reasoning and human reasoning? Uh, and I will follow up with uh, AGI, but um, can you uh, give us a little bit of um, your point of view on this subject? Of course. So that reminds me, we didn't quite get to the Turing test uh, in the in the last bit, but we, we certainly went down a rabbit hole, and so it was time we to. Time... <laughs> should we should we should we come back to the Turing test? I think we can we get should. to it in the in the same chunk of answers. And All right, so that's awesome. What what we have with machine learning in this inductive turn, as I was mentioning, there's really I think three periods you're looking at here, and I think the third one is yet to come. And the, the last part of the way that humans reason, which has not been well modeled in artificial intelligence yet, is called abductive reasoning. So abductive reasoning is not when you take a rule and then infer an outcome. And it's not when you look at a bunch of outcomes to infer the rules, which is deductive and inductive respectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's when you look at a particular scenario and you're able to make a successful educated guess about what the rule could be. And so that is fundamentally different from those other two systems. And the reason why it is difficult to model in AI is because it often relies on concepts which are much less easy to formalize. So deductive reasoning is almost exactly how you would write any kind of software engineering program. In fact, if we if we look at the history of computer science, we can look back at a, maybe the most important paper in information theory is the master's thesis, the famous master's thesis of Claude Shannon, where he is the very first person to point out, hey, you can show classical deductive logic can be modeled using circuits. He was the very, really the first person to articulate this in such a way that it became widely accepted. And so, but the point being that writing a simple if else statement is, is not much more than simple deductive reasoning. The reason why abductive reasoning is difficult as compared to deductive reasoning is that abductive reasoning relies frequently on things like hypothesis or metaphor or analogy things which are much more complicated to map into written rules and things which don't necessarily emerge from simply looking at a million pictures of what a highway looks like uh, or 10 million or even 100 million. The, the thing that abductive reasoning is particularly good for is handling novelty and handling unusual situations. It's where, we, it's where we take domain expertise maybe from one area and apply it to another. And we recognize that this thing over here actually applies to this thing that just happened. So any of your listeners that are AI nerds will be jumping all over me, by the way, and saying, no, 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 many people have tried to do abductive reasoning. And they're absolutely right. So the, the problem is, is that abductive reasoning has kind of gotten, as with all of these terms, inductive and deductive, has been broken down into many different kinds of subdomains or, or subroutines of reasoning. So with inductive patterns, for example, 
you have you know neural nets or kernel based systems so there's many different ways to try and approach or model inductive reasoning but they're all inductive in their nature abductive mm -hmm. reasoning kind of gets confused in the regard that some people have tried to build ai systems which are able to do something like abductive reasoning and the, the way to think about abductive reasoning again is using hypotheses or analogies or metaphors or critical thinking skills to infer or look for unique insights in a particular situation. Hmm. So it's where you try and solve a problem by making that educated guess. So just to give your listeners more context, because it is kind of, it's difficult to t discuss and that's part of why it's difficult to model. A very simple example is, is one that, that was articulated by the originator of, of, abduction today, Charles Sanders Peirce, American philosopher. And it is, if you see a, let's say you have a jar of M&Ms on your table in front of you, right? Well, maybe the jar is the jar that M&Ms issues for a special holiday version of their product, right? And so, you know, okay, that's the M&Ms jar. So if that is that jar, then the M&Ms are in that jar because that is the M&M jar for Christmas. So you, you, you know from the rule that this is the M&M jar, therefore there's M&Ms in it. Now, the inductive way to look at it is that maybe you don't know anything about that special holiday version of M&Ms, right? So this is a new jar of uh, M&Ms that you haven't seen in advertisement or something. However, you're walking through your daily life and you notice many of these new special holiday versions of M&Ms in the window. And so after repeated exposures, you recognize, okay, this is like the new winter Christmas version of M&Ms. Um, and so last but not least, what abductive reasoning is, is that let's say you have the jar on your table there are some M&Ms which have fallen out onto the table and you look around and you go, huh, I think these M&Ms came from that jar. And so the reason that is fundamentally different is because it's, it's, it's not a situation where you knew the M&Ms were going to be in the jar and you can decide that's where they came from. And it's also not a case where you may be saw lots of jars like that and can decide that it is an M&M's jar, but rather it is a situation where you see these M&M's on the table and you sort of have an insight or a eureka moment that they probably came from that jar. <laughs> um, right. and so that type of reasoning, again, it's not something you can always reliably have in pattern matching. So for example, that's a perfect case of novelty. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, mm -hmm. if, a, if an AI program has never seen this particular holiday packaging for M&Ms before, it's not going to recognize it because there's nothing in the database of images that it's had that tells it, oh, this is the promotional holiday M&Ms. And you certainly can't write a rule that will tell you about every possible case in the future. Right. Uh, so there's many things that are going to happen in the future. M&Ms may come out with yet another holiday promotional package, and it's hard for you to write a rule today that would be able to take care of that case. And so the point is, is that there's this part of human reasoning, which is properly called abductive reasoning, and which is what you're doing when you're able to make that insight. And it's very difficult to model computationally. It simply doesn't lend itself mm -hmm. well to mm -hmm. being modeled using formal languages or formal systems. So does that make sense? Makes total sense, makes total sense. So we, we mentioned about um, many, many of uh, definitions here. And I would like uh, to ask you, could you explain more precisely uh, why do you think a computer can't think? It's a famous debate within the philosophy of AI, Thomas, which is what we call the division between weak AI or strong AI. And this is a very common practice in philosophy where 
we label sort of points of view or arguments as either the strongest version of that argument or the weakest version of that argument. And so like the strongest version or strong AI would be something like arguing or asserting that AI can genuinely be conscious and genuinely think and understand in the way a human could, that we think that that will eventually happen. We already talked about why I think from a simple materialist argument that if it can happen in your brain, then it can happen outside your brain is likely. But again, over a very long time span. The weak version of that argument or what we would call weak AI is simply something along the lines of, well, we're confident that AI will be able to replicate something like artificial general intelligence. You don't need the consciousness. You don't need the understanding or the feelings or the qualitative experience. But if the AI can simply replicate some of the functioning of human reasoning, some of the cognitive modules we have, well, then we know that that AI will will exist and already seems to exist. So arguments against weak AI seem to already have been doomed or failed. Uh, and some people did think that it would be very difficult for humans to ever reason, or sorry, machines to ever reason at the level that they do now, already out competing the world's best chess players, Go players, and some of the other things we're seeing. But returning to the case for strong AI, there is a very famous argument that has become quite controversial, but it would be silly to, to not mention it in, in a discussion of the philosophy of AI. And that argument is called the Chinese room. It was articulated by a, a well-known philosopher named John Searle. And the argument goes something like this. In fact, I'll try and put a little twist on it that makes it easier to understand for, for your audience which is many of us have had the experience where you are using Google Translate, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you have a conversation with somebody in a foreign language, you might use Google Translate several times. Well, the argument goes that if you have this tool, your, your phone, this Google Translate app on your phone, and someone gives you many different verses in French, or many different phrases in Romanian or Esperanto, and you feed them into Google Translate, even if you have a very lengthy conversation, let's say you spoke with this person for weeks or even months, even if you exchange many, many messages, if you're always using Google Translate, all of us intuitively know that does not suddenly mean I know French. Just because I can respond to you in French by using Google Translate, that doesn't mean by extension that I know French. The Chinese room argument that was articulated by Searle kind of works like this, but instead of using Google Translate, let's do a throwback and imagine you actually just had to use like an English to French dictionary, right? So let's say I take your messages and I'm off the grid or something, right? We're, we're having an off the grid adventure. You're speaking to me in French. I pull out my old school French to English dictionary and I translate every single word you give me into English. And then I translate all my words back into French. Well, again, if we do this over and over again, it doesn't suddenly mean that after having a conversation where I have mechanically one-to-one -one translated all these words that I suddenly understand French. I can recognize the patterns. I can recognize maybe that it has a certain structure and I can use a tool, a reference, a database, perhaps the internet to find what the English word is for the French word. But regardless of whether or not the tool is Google Translate or the tool is a database or the tool is a paper dictionary, that is very different than my capacity to understand and speak a uh, language. And so the Chinese room argument is basically this is that that is exactly how AI works, that that is how GPT works, that it doesn't understand what you're saying to it, that it simply is referencing symbols that have been entered into a knowledge base that can be referenced automatically. 
And there's really no function or no mechanism by which engineers or AI researchers even conceive of trying to build something like comprehension or understanding. Hmm. This may change in the future, but if you look at very popular AI textbooks, like the famous uh, seminal textbook by Russell and Norvig, there's not really a chapter in there about how to write a piece of software that can comprehend. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really only how do you do something like language mapping. And so, but again, that, that mechanical algorithm of mapping the language is not the same as understanding it. And the argument that Searle made in the Chinese room is that this is in fact what a computer is doing always, not just when it's a large language model, but when it's doing any kind of operation. It's mm -hmm. simply referencing different variables and mapping them to different outputs. And it's completely missing this comprehension layer that we associate with consciousness. Perfect. Thank you for, um, for this detailed uh, explanations. Um, I would like to ask you about, um, about uh, singularity. Could you introduce singular singularity to people who are not familiar with the term? And could you, can you, can you give your opinion on singularity? Yeah, so I've heard the term singularity used a handful of ways in terms of AI. It's frequently used as kind of an alarmist term. Sometimes the singularity is used in reference to what we call like post-humanism, which is where computers and humans, their intelligence get linked up, something kind of like Neuralink, so we become <laughs> a singular entity. And another fun argument from philosophy, which was made by uh, the Australian philosopher David Chalmers, is that part of this is kind of already happening. It's, it's, it's what he calls uh, sort of an extended theory of mind. That, and the question he posits is, is your phone a part of your mind? And this is actually a surprisingly difficult question to answer. If you start thinking about it for a few minutes, you start to realize, well, Uh, I seem to do a lot of the same things with my phone that I do with my mind. I use it to remember things. I use it to think through things. Uh, and so that kind of just gives you a taste of like how you use your smartphone. And as we see these interfaces get closer and closer to something like a, a, a brain link interface, um, then it, you can get a sense of, of where that idea comes from. But the more common usage you're hearing lately is one from AI alarmism. And it's kind of an odd use of the term singularity, in my opinion. I might have named it something else. But basically what people tend to mean is they mean something like runaway AI. Uh, what people are usually talking about with the singularity is the idea that AI will start building AI, which will start building AI, and... Each AI will be iteratively better, version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, until you get a kind of super intelligence. Uh, this has been discussed by people like Nick Bostrom. So the original argument uh, that if you're putting it like in condensed philosophical form to make it extremely clear for the audience is it, the, the first premise would be that there will be an AI, which we make right? We're already working on AI. And eventually we'll get to a point where the AI is equivalent perhaps to human intelligence. Again, we obviously had a long discussion about what I think are the current limitations there. But the idea being that it's possible that one day, again, if you believe that everything that happens in the mind happens in the brain, One day, maybe we'll be able to take that stuff and find a way to externalize it. So, so we have something that is an artifact that we made uh, that can do work for us that has equivalent human intelligence. The idea then goes that if there is such an AI, right, we've made an AI which is equivalent to ours, then eventually that AI will make another AI. And the AI that it can make will be superior to itself. So then you'll have maybe the combined powers 
of our intelligence plus this external intelligence we've manufactured and we'll join forces to make a, a, another version that's even better. And sometimes people call this AI plus. And so then you run into this train where you go, okay, AI plus will make AI plus plus. Mm -hmm. So it increments, right? And then eventually this becomes like so many things in technology, maybe becomes like a Moore's curve or a Moore's law where you get this exponential super intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get, you know, this kind of idea of a God like uh, machine. And some people call that the singularity is where you get this, where eventually it takes off into this kind of exponential hyper intelligence, super intelligence. So that sort of condensed version was articulated by people like Bostrom and Chalmers. And I think the original argument comes from a philosopher uh, named Good. But my opinion on that argument mm -hmm. is that it very much puts the cart before the horse. So to me, those are not necessarily given assumptions. <clears throat> So we might say that that argument is philosophically valid, right? That if all those steps were true, then perhaps a superintelligence would be inevitable. And indeed, some of the writers that spend a lot of time thinking about that seem to just take it for granted that those arguments are true. But I think that they are, again, very much assumptions. So we already began with the argument, we, we already discussed about how human intelligence and human reasoning has components which are fundamentally different from how AI currently reasons. The second question though, is if there is an AI that it will necessarily build an AI that's superior to itself. To me, that's a very tenuous assumption. First off, it almost implies that it would be consciously deciding to do so. So we've already talked about, you know, regardless of whether or not you were able to get all of the intelligence functions there, that doesn't necessarily give you consciousness. It seems as if it would be decided to do that. And then the second question is, is that if we're defining the first AI as equivalent in power to human intelligence, right? So we've finally gotten it there. Well, why would we assume that that AI would be better at building an AI or would be able to build an AI which was an order of magnitude better than the one that we can build if our benchmark is ourselves? If we're saying this AI is, is equal to human intelligence, why do we think this AI will A, be motivated, but B, be capable of building a new AI which is an order of magnitude more superior than anything we could conceive? So that, to me, again, tenuous assumption. The, the last part, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll point out there is to, to make new technology, again, harkens back to the discussion we had around abductive reasoning. The AI would not just have to make a bigger, better version of itself, which would require perhaps more resources, regardless of, you know, we've already seen how much resources go into training sets and training new large language models. Perhaps it would need something larger and bigger, but it would have to come up with novel solutions to the hard problems we encounter in developing AI systems ourselves. And that's exactly the kind of human creative thinking, which we discussed as being something which remains perhaps in the human domain, that kind of unique insight-based problem solving, those eureka moments. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for, for detailing and, and explaining further your point of view on singularity. <laughs> I was what very, are your uh, thoughts, Thomas? Where do you think we're at? Oh my, on singularity, um, I think I... I still need to to give a few I think I still need to have more inputs on, on singularity. Um 
But like we said in this episode, um, I am not too preoccupied about singularity really when we're already facing challenges with AI that are that needs to be tackled now to try to, like we said, minimize uh, the negative impact, let's say, which is something right now. As, um, as for what you mentioned, comp having the motivation and second, um, building a better AI, those two assumptions, I feel like it is important to have this in mind and, and when the time comes, we'll be able to uh, try to understand better just two assumptions and and in the context I, I i feel like we can we can replicate a lot simulate a lot of how we do things but so far even with the latest advancements uh and and with what we discussed in this episode um i would be more towards the balance where singularity is a uh, very long term thing if it exists one day because like like we said we are capable of building things that are very human hum, like similar to human interactions and, and human ways of doing things but a human is not capable a human needs um can just build better and better and better ai um without like uh, retraining the models and and understanding what is not being done correctly and and giving more data and and like, again the example of like the, the the horses like the the car with two horses thing like we need to train more the model with two things so singularity itself um um i would um express myself with um caution and say that i am not necessarily um i think we're not here yet and i'm not sure we will be but i am sure that it will be a discussion at some point and it will come to um to doing to define precisely specific things like consciousness or like um, like motivation um, and a lot of words uh, so it will have a lot of psychology and definition into it to be able to to have like to to have a state on this subject and I think we'll have different states based on the approaches that we've done but again <laughs> just uh, <laughs> just out of the mind but thanks a lot for um, for your thoughts and uh, it helps me understand the topic better and uh well my, my my next question is um because when we describe this kind of um this kind of uh, models uh, i remember s seeing a video on linkedin where uh, it was a tesla and you know tesla have uh, uh, have computer vision that recognize the vehicle in front of you um and um and it was a, a, a car uh, and two horses in front so it was like a very old uh, vehicle <laughs> And um, the the Tesla was like at one moment showing a car, the other moment showing a truck, and the other moment showing like and it what it kept it kept changing because the model couldn't recognize what it was, and um, so so I would like to ask you about um, so so if we if we come back to the to the present and the latest uh, advancements in the field, um, from your perspective. So we understand this is the main difference between a human being being able to assume things and like the hard time models can have to learn from those um, scenarios where, where it did use uh, specific things. Um, so with the latest advancements, sorry, what is your point of view on an AI achieving these kind of tasks? And we could include maybe in the answer uh, open AI or open source models. What, what do you think? Of course. So that's a great question. As it relates to the advancements today, like I was saying before, 
there's a lot of people that have attempted to try and take some of these forms of abductive reasoning and try and model them. So the difficulty is that what they inevitably end up doing is they try and shoehorn abductive reasoning into induction. They say, okay, there's a certain number of strategies that humans seem to use when they are encountering novelty, when they encounter the horse and buggy in front of the car that they used to figure out how to respond in that situation. And if, if there is a, a past routine or a past set of experiences we can draw on, then we can transition this from being a novel experience to one that we can categorize as uh, an inductive experience. We can, we, can, we can recognize that the horse and buggy in front of us is maybe not one that we've ever encountered before. It certainly doesn't look like the other trucks and cars that we encounter on the road, but we know it is a vehicle. And so we can guess that it is going to behave similarly to other vehicles. So that is kind of using a, a trick of more or less borrowing one kind of program and applying it to a new situation. So there are many different ways in which researchers have tried to take hypotheses or metaphors or analogies and tried to run through sort of rote examples of mirroring this. But the difficulty is, is of course, it's, it's simply not possible to capture all of the kind of real world novelty you can experience. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of what we're seeing with OpenAI and ChatGPT, it's actually a perfect example of the difference between inductive and abductive reasoning. So if you look at OpenAI right now and you go to enter a prompt, one thing that is surprising that GPT still can't do, but which makes obvious sense if you understand these dynamics, is that it can't multiply maybe two five-digit numbers together. So right now, mm -hmm. if you get on your MacBook and you open the calculator and you do 10,504, you multiply it by 11,931 it will return it to you in seconds. And obviously the hardware in your MacBook has been optimized to do those kinds of operations. However, GPT astonishingly will get it completely wrong. Uh, it, will, it will generate a number which looks right based on sort of an inductive pattern. In other words, mm -hmm. it might get the number of digits right, but the actual correct digits will be wrong. So it might get the length of the total number right, but it won't get the actual number right. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why that is and how abductive reasoning relates to AGI is that you have to understand that with inductive reasoning, there's a very important difference between seeing patterns and understanding them. And so understanding and comprehension are certainly unique and powerful parts of the human experience. And the thing is, is that a lot of people, based on the terminology in AI, can sometimes get the mistaken impression that these programs or these machines do have comprehension or understanding. And I think this is actually a common mistake that happens across all fields. The, I think that the key issue is with the term machine learning, which gives people the real impression that the machines are indeed learning. <laughs> but that's not really what's going on in the sense that we use the term learning when you're saying my five-year-old learned in school today how to count. What's really more accurate is something like they are incrementally fitting or they are iteratively approximating is 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 a better description of what's going on and it makes a very fundamental difference the the reason why is what that means is is that large language models can't read and in fact there aren't any ais that can read and this is a really big deal because if you are most human beings on this planet, a, a majority of us create our knowledge banks and consume knowledge and just knowledge through reading. It is a primary form by which we learn things, of course. 
of, you know, naturally we can get into discussions of whether I prefer audiobooks or learning from YouTube videos. But at the end of the day, we're, we're all reading a heck of a lot. Uh, whether or not you're just reading things on Instagram or, or regardless of what kind of where you're getting your media from, you're doing a lot of reading. And the point is, is that even though an AI, a large language model, can see many impressions of a mathematics textbook, it may know what the next part of a paragraph in that textbook is likely going to look like. Or it may know, hmm, when I see two five-digit numbers nearby each other, a number with this many digits tends to come afterwards. But the point is, is that even in a very short paragraph that a sixth grader can understand, it cannot fundamentally comprehend what is actually happening in the text. And so since it can't read, it has no understanding. It doesn't know, it cannot learn from that book. It can read, or can, exactly, this is, the, this is the difficulty with the language. We kind of have to reinvent it. It's not really learning the mathematics from the textbook. It's seeing the mathematics textbook over and over again and deciding what they think it'll have, what, what comes next in this chapter or what comes next in this sentence. But that's mm -hmm. different from even reading a single mathematics textbook and truly understanding it. My point being that humans can read even small segments or expert excerpts of a calculus textbook. I doubt anyone in college sat and read, and read their, college, their, their college calculus textbook from start to finish and, and actually read every single page. But even if we read 20 or 30 percent of a calculus textbook, we can get the gist of how calculus truly works. And we can then use that knowledge and generalize it so that when we encounter problems of a similar sort, we know how to solve them, even if it's two five-digit numbers we've never seen in a mathematics problem together before. But uh, a machine learning program is not truly learning in the sense that it's not actually learning how to do that. And you can show it hundreds of mathematics textbooks, and it will not understand and learn those things even as well as someone who is only studying when they're hungover right before the exam. Thanks for the, this last <laughs> um, comparison. Uh, no, it, it makes total sense. Um, uh, I think what the the question that I have on top of my mind uh, after your uh, your great explanations, um, I think I would like to ask about. Uh, taking into uh, what you described that uh, there is no um, so far there is not a, a model that can comprehend and and it will always like through data learn patterns and how things with statistics should look like but it won't be able to read or, or understand concepts um, what is your stake on AGI being achievable and um, uh, because w when I think of, of those problems, I always think of like those will because of the latest advancements today, we have um, we have large language models that can increase a lot the, w the way we do things, the way we learn things, the way we um, approach problems, because now we can have an assistant that have in mind the context of the 20th best books of one specific field so that I will be able to try to go on top of the field faster and I will be able to do fa more breakthrough. And when we look back, um, since internet started and what is happening today in the field of AI, everything went so fast in so little time and it feels like it is exponential. And when you think about reinforcement learning and all those crazy models that are being built, if you combine all those models that have specific um, specific functions and, and, and that are very good to do one thing, and they all feed each other with reinforcement learning through using them, even though AGI is not achievable uh, from, from this perspective, because it like not one model will be able to like comprehend the context, but because they're feeding each other with new data, real time data. And if we like go further, big data, and we have like 
so many data is all the time, like for example, the little car that I talked about uh, on, on LinkedIn, uh, it recognizes that the pattern is not being, so we add a new um, deductive line where we recognize that the pattern, the car in front of me keep changing. So I'm struggling recognizing it. So then accessing to a new database of all vehicle kinds, and then I will find the new match of a new vehicle can. And I think this is like the next step of, of the mind, but uh, I don't want to go too far from, from my question because, um, because, um, but, but this is like the idea of like going further big data and reinforcement learning and growing all those breakthrough right now. What is your stake um, of, uh, about AGI? Do you think it's achievable? Um, yeah, this, I think this would be my question. <laughs> Okay, well, let's. So, so I would say this. I would say that what we're really learning now is that induction is a heck of a lot more powerful than we thought it was. So, again, it can't learn how to multiply two five digit numbers together, no matter how many mathematics textbooks you show it. So, it's, it's remarkably limited, but it's also remarkably powerful in the regard that, to your point, when you have these vast data sets that we now have especially when you plug yourself into the internet, uh, it's, it's amazing how far induction will get you. And for example, we, we now basically know that through induction alone, it's basically possible to pass the Turing test. So with ChatGPT, the, the milestone here is really that the Turing test has been defeated. ChatGPT has in many ways overcome the Turing test as how it's traditionally conceived. Most people have robust conversations with ChatGPT. And if I were to tell you it was a AI chatbot or it was a human in a call center somewhere being aided by the internet, it would be difficult to tell the difference. Uh, if anything, the only thing that tells us it's probably not a human is how fast it is. <laughs> is that ChatGPT seems to provide remarkably full and comprehensive answers far more quickly than any human could. So in, 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 if anything, it's, it's outperforming humans on the Turing test. And that's maybe its giveaway. But perhaps we could build in timeouts or something and, and that would make it more believable. <laughs> time dot sleep in Python and <laughs> exactly yeah set time out in JavaScript and so the the point being is that ChatGPT really represents the defeat of the Turing test in its classical sense. The thing that it simultaneously shows us, precisely due to that problem of induction, is that the Turing test is probably inadequate for what we're trying to get after. That, that chasing the Turing test alone clearly is not enough to get you to AGI. There's so many parts of human reasoning that do not fall into that kind of category regarding things like learning and comprehension that the Turing test simply does not remotely capture the scope of different methods, modules of cognition that AGI would need for us to recognize it as having achieved something like human intelligence. Now, a key point here, though, is that some specialists might say, well, AGI isn't necessarily human intelligence. And that's completely fair. But what many people hear when they are hearing the term AGI when they are envisioning AGI, when you're talking to the layman or a non-technical person or someone who's simply not a philosophy or an AI researcher, what, the, what they're really talking about is something like a human intelligence or that, that can replicate most of the functions of the human mind. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what the long-term prospects are, to your point, we are now seeing many systems emerge which are syntheses of these different techniques. They feed several different kinds of approaches to AI into each other. 
there are many systems which are not strict, strictly deductive, inductive, and there are many that also incorporate semi-abductive approaches. But the, the thing about AGI or about replicating human intelligence is while I made the argument earlier that it is fundamentally more difficult to formalize a certain kind of human reasoning and represent it in zeros and ones, that nevertheless, human intelligence is materialist, right? Regardless of whether or not you're representing it using silicon and circuits, which are in some respects arbitrary choices for a computer. We've seen computing machines developed out of many different substrates than just what you have in your laptop. It's possible to recreate those kinds of computational mechanisms in using analog or mechanical methods. Hydraulics have been tried very early on, but you can also clearly replicate them using some kinds of, we have like biological circuits that have been created by my biomedical researchers. The point being that clearly whatever happens in your mind is happening inside your brain. And if it's happening inside your brain, it's happening in the neurons and cells inside your, your brain. And so if it can happen in that substrate, the idea of it being able to be replicated is, is more or less given, right? Because we could maybe grow a brain in a laboratory. And if we were able to converse with it somehow using a brain link interface or something of the sort, perhaps that would be a kind of artificial intelligence. It would be something that we created outside of our body, and perhaps we could alter it substantively. Obviously, we might begin with something very close to what we have inside our own minds if we're trying to simply replicate it or clone it in a, in a test tube. But iteratively, we might move away from that until we get to something that is quite different, has, has evolved away from traditional human brains. And nevertheless, it may replicate a lot of what happens in the human mind and it's artificially created. Maybe it has brain link interfaces. The point is, is that reasoning happens in the cells, in the atoms of the mind, uh, inside the, the brain. The mind is part of the brain or is created by the brain. And therefore we know it can be manifested materially. So whether or not that happens through a computer or some other artifact is merely a matter of developing or recreating a technology which can do what the human brain already does. Will it look like a human brain? Will it be made of organic matter or inorganic matter? Open questions. But the point is, is that Clearly, there are parts of human reasoning we've already succeeded at mapping to external technology. And I think that our capacity to do that will only accelerate. As for the prospects of AGI now, I think that, again, it seems that the methods or substrates we're building AI with now have real problems in being able to replicate the great breadth of human reasoning. And they certainly don't seem to be able to achieve consciousness, understanding, creativity in the way that we do. Hmm. Thanks. That makes sense. Uh, uh, I would just like to, on that last point, I would like to ask you about consciousness again. So you mentioned creativity and reasoning. So you would define consciousness with those two terms or, or is there more things that you would take into account when defining reasoning, consciousness, sorry, when you define consciousness, um, is there more specific things that you would think of uh, or that would be the main two thing of what human's consciousness is? And so if... Uh, 
we managed to do all of the above <laughs> to do what you described um, either with with uh, analog computing, uh, quantum computing. Uh, you mentioned us here uh, in, in the bio field. Uh, there are different ways to process, um, like to do differently and not, not not binary. So, is this how you would define consciousness? And like, at what point could we say an AGI is um, have a con conscience con is conscious? That's a tough test, isn't it? The deciding whether or not something's conscious. It's it's in fact it's a test we have all the time. The The problem with consciousness, I would say, is that A, it's hard to measure, uh, but B, it seems to come in many flavors. So to begin answering your question, I would simply say no. I don't think it's necessarily the case that you have to have creativity or all these aspects of human reasoning in order to be conscious. And the reason why we know that, of course, is because we recognize that clearly many animals are conscious. There are animals that are adequately intelligent to exhibit things like creative reasoning, octopi, ravens, dogs, of course, of course. But the, the point is, is that obviously even very simple animals, we suspect, seem to have a certain kind of conscious experience. However, we're not entirely sure, right? I mean, we're not entirely sure. That's that's fundamentally part of the problem of mind is, is it's difficult to know if your mind is real inside of my mind. Uh, the, the famous problem since the time of, of David Hume. So it's not necessary that a computer has consciousness to achieve general intelligence. Uh, and at the same time, it's not necessary to have human-like creativity for it to be conscious either. So perhaps it could be conscious, but just in a way that is of a different flavor than the consciousness that we have. That might be more like what a bat has or something of you know, another famous example from philosophy. What's it like to be a bat? What we what we consider to be consciousness is, is certainly something along the lines of what a philosopher would call qualia. It's the, it's the qualitative subjective experience of reality. It's the fact that not only do you experience the world, you have, it feels like something to experience the world. You, you know that when you have your webcam on right now, that your webcam in theory is perceiving the room that you're in. But when you perceive the room you're in, you don't just see it in zeros and ones. You don't just see it in pixels and recognize the different things that are there. It feels like something to be in that room. You have a kind of mental state of it. And that seems to be deeply part of consciousness. We recognize that even things that have very simple knowledge bases, very simple knowledge structures, even perhaps down to the level of what we would call a primal part of the brain, a system one part of the brain, sometimes uh, an, <laughs> the term lizard brain is used. Is used. Uh, the, the part of our brain that just has instincts about eating and drinking and mating, we suspect that maybe even that too has a conscious aspect that, that even very simple animals might feel things uh, even if they don't have the process to do any kind of complex reasoning. So consciousness is something like a separate question from the reasoning and the creativity. And the last point I want to leave you with, the, first, the, the, three, the three takeaways I was hoping to tell you were that I think that AI very much is in line with, with simply doing philosophy. It's, it's, to me, it's a very direct line between modeling human reasoning using deductive logic down to simply finding different strategies to do so using a computing substrate. The, the second one we discussed, of course, was this difference in abductive reasoning and what we're seeing now. And the last thing I'll mention is that regarding AGI and consciousness, there's a funny, but I think arbitrary connection in science fiction where for some reason we are scared of the idea of a conscious computer. 
Of course, a conscious computer would then, if a computer was conscious, we seem to associate consciousness with what philosophers would call moral status. Once something is conscious, we seem to think that it deserves some kind of moral consideration. If you're conscious of the experiences you're having, then perhaps you can have bad experiences. And if you can have bad experiences, well, then perhaps we can wrong you or, or do something unethical where you, you know, that putting you in a bad experience would be a bad thing. So consciousness and, and AGI and danger have kind of always been related. I, again, I think it's art, artificial that that's the case, arbitrary. I, I, it's simply the fact that we've, we've got this idea in our mind that maybe an AGI will become self-conscious. And then once it's self-conscious, it will be evil. <laughs> um, so th that's, that's really a, another part of the, the consciousness piece is that when we make conscious decisions, we know consciously whether or not they're right or wrong. And you can, it seems as if we are actively choosing to make right decisions, but we know that that's an active choice. And therefore we know that other conscious beings might occasionally make conscious choices to do the wrong thing. And that's where we seem to get scared or at least portray it in things like science fiction. The, the last one I wanted to leave you with, though, is I think that that is wholly unnecessary for AGI to be of concern. So a lot of people are focused on problems like the singularity, the idea that eventually there will be a super intelligence that no longer needs us, that becomes self-conscious and decides it no longer needs us and is misanthropic by nature and decides to harm human beings or try and take over the universe. And we can have a discussion about whether or not that's possible, but what I'm saying is that it's wholly unnecessary for you to achieve that milestone before AI starts to become dangerous. So if anything, I'd argue that milestone is, an, is probably a long way off, but we shouldn't necessarily disregard the risks that we're seeing with AI now, just because it's not self-conscious, just because it hasn't necessarily achieved human creativity. That doesn't mean it's not dangerous. I think perhaps some of the more dangerous aspects of what you're seeing in AI now are things like autonomous agents, where you would be able to, any bad actor would be able to point uh, autonomous AI at a particular task that it would then use all of its resources, all of its strategies to try and brute force its way to what we might recognize as something illegal or unethical, whether it was hacking into a system that was quite hardened, it would perhaps be able to scour the internet for all of the different exploits that were available for a difficult security system, and then autonomously move and iterate through each one, learning along the way, uh, using that fitting iterative mechanism and find a way in. So at the end of the day, what we have now is not that we have to be worried about evil AI so much as we have to worry about what we've always worried about, which is evil people using AI uh, for a, a bad end. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, while uh, I was listening to you, this is what I had in mind also, because um, a lot of the time we we were scared. And I think this is perfect that you mentioned that because I feel like we've, um, uh, we're have we more than one hour in. And I feel like with this episode, we really, um, you really showed us uh, about um, the, I mean, it, everyone can argue about specific arguments that you've made before in the podcast. Uh, I am personally uh, aligned with uh, your point uh, of view. And, um, and I would like to emphasize what you just said, which is there is no need for an AGI, evil AGI, for us to be scared. You mentioned cybersecurity. Um, we can do, like, just with ChatGPT, and I won't give any idea, but just with ChatGPT and, and generative art, we've seen already, and, and we're not ready, uh, but, like, one of the main topic right now is disinformation. And because of how the human is, 
it is so easy to create viral posts about fake things that go viral. But when you try to put the truth out, or at least like you've researched and you've documented, those posts on social media won't have interactions. But the one that have like a crazy pictures and it, it will be it will become very easy and i would like to to have uh, your, your your point of view on that because i don't want to to speak for for you but um, i speak from from my own perspective but but the fact that we already have those tools we will face a mass a massive disinformation wave and and the questions come how do we prevent people and and from from what you were saying i think we're scared of an evil idea uh, being scared of an Uh, evil AGI I mean this AGI won't have built itself maybe at some point but it is because we see as humans um, uh, the world as it is with our emotions that we, we we want to recreate things that we feel and that we see and I was the other day just thinking how to use a database and how to like try to fake emotions with prompts and using like the the, the API ChatGPT API And just with a, like, for example, uh, like a, a, an Arduino a looping system, you can, you can recreate uh, with like adding one when like you do sentiment analysis on text. And so you have a, a way of like knowing at what state um, the, the script you've written is. You can, you can use specific prompts to like feed and alter the way you will answer. And so, so why am i saying that it is because uh just like you said uh i think all of what we were scared of are like aspects of humans and this evil ai uh would just be a creation of uh of what humans of, of an aspect of a human being um and so Uh, to 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 finish on, on me drifting a little bit here, uh, and then I, I will uh, I would like to have your your perspective on, uh, perspective and opinion on what I just say. But uh, I think it is super super important to say that uh, we don't need to come, we don't need to achieve this point to be scared of AI. And today there is disinformation, cybersecurity, and a whole lot more. Um, problems that we can already face and need to be discussed like regulations ethics because the progress is going so fast and regulation have always been super slow and i will cut myself here because uh, uh, i would like to have your opinion and this is a very personal um, statement but uh, also also i felt like um, a need to to mention and to and to add this so What, do, you, do you have anything to say about uh, what, what I just uh, said? Yeah, so I mean, there's no doubt that one of the additional challenges we're seeing is there's a lot of anxiety around the generative AI and how it might infringe on creatives and the way that they have been able to make a living for themselves. You're seeing that anxiety play out in things like the protests of the screenwriters in Hollywood and of course musicians with the song by AI Drake in the weekend. So there's, there's a lot of questions and anxiety around creative content and the information space quickly becoming dominated by AI generated content. I would say all of those concerns are valid. <laughs> So, so yes, I, I would say there's, it's, it's very hard to imagine how you prevent, again, maybe people that have, and earlier I said evil people, and I, I would like to correct that. Really, I don't think people are fundamentally good or evil so much as people occasionally do evil things and usually do good things. But the, the point being that someone with bad intentions in a particular scenario might be intentionally creating a, a heck of a lot of generated content that we see either in the form of spam or as bots, which were already a challenge before, simply through automation, but will be an extraordinary challenge now that AI can, to your point, mimic a certain kind of sentiment that 
seems as if it was it passes the Turing test, right? How, how do you detect that AI? So the the difficulty I think we will have will indeed be how do things like social media platforms resolve that problem? I think they're already headed in the right direction. The and, and this has been somewhat anticipated, right? So there was a famous inversion, as I'm sure you know, some some people that remember the NFT craze all read about Walter Benjamin's famous essay on art in the age of mechanical reproduction, uh, which makes the argument about how in the new age of mechanical reproduction of art, he wrote this an awful lot of time ago, so uh, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, the <laughs> me mechanical reproduction was, was the concern then rather than digital. But the idea was basically that Art used to be valuable because it was the unique work of that artist. Paintings are in the Louvre because they are the original or they are the prototype. And the idea of what happened afterwards when it became easy to mechanically recreate art or to take a, a work of art, you and I can simply... Google any famous image or famous painting and we'll find thousands of versions of it on Google. Well, why is the original item still valuable? And it's valuable because it was made by a human. So the way that I see this going forward is that Identity verification, verifying the human touch, verifying that this was crafted by a person will become of wildly more importance than it has been in the recent past. So we definitely will have to resolve the problem of was this crafted by a human or crafted by an AI? And we'll probably have to do it at scale, which will be challenging. And the point is, is that obviously if you're in a sea of generated AI content, it might be the case that actually the, the human verified content is the exception rather than the rule. But then that's the content that becomes maybe especially valuable or uh, then it becomes a tractical problem. If you try and flag every piece of AI content, that's going to be very difficult because it's going to be indiscernible. If you do the reverse where you try and get every single person that's creating their own content to verify themselves, that's a much more reasonable problem to solve just in terms of scale and the fact that people, content creators, creatives themselves have a motivation to find a way to verify themselves and say that indeed they made it themselves. So ironically, a lot of people have pointed out <laughs> that this is perhaps a surprise use of uh, the blockchain, that, that ironically, perhaps this will be how the blockchain finds its killer app uh, by, by tracing the the actual signature if you would of di digital communications and verifying that they indeed came from a human hmm thanks makes sense yeah i like uh, i really like these ideas i'm also concerned about uh when quantum computing will drop off how how do you protect something like the blockchain uh, but I think this is another topic to be discussed uh, <laughs> because we've discussed um, a lot so far. Maybe I would have a few uh, a few more questions um, to 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 pursue and try to close this wide chapter that that we've opened in this episode. And, and thanks again for taking the time to to come on the show. And and I hope for the people who are listening that, uh, like myself, uh, we are learning. Uh, a lot from you and um and this is super exciting and i think it is a, a very interesting time to be uh to be alive to be conscious <laughs> let's try to define consciousness again but um so thanks again for for sharing uh, all your opinions and perspective um and knowledge i, I would like to <laughs> ask you, you <laughs> i would like to ask you about um so we mentioned a bit creativity um we could discuss truly creative, but this is um, what is truly creative. This is what, what you kind of defined before. I would like to ask you about more concrete thing in the present. 
who should be worried and who shouldn't be worried about their jobs um, based on our entire discussion. Could you give us some insights about that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I think about this, this question, I think of a quote by a, another popular philosopher of AI, Selma Bringsjord, who said that computation, among other things, is beneath us. And so it's a neat concept. And I think it's, I think it's relatively true. I, I think that if you look at what we prize as human effort, human creativity, the kinds of labor that we consider to be drudgery or to be menial labor is often the kind of thing that could be automated away or which could be done by a machine. And what does that leave room for? Well, again, that leaves room for what I would say are things which properly involve abductive reasoning. So the areas of reasoning which aren't simply rule following, like in the way that accounting might be, or which aren't simply pattern matching and repeating the same task over and over again. But the parts of human labor, which involve actual creative thinking, things like analogy, metaphor, critical thinking, the humanities, despite what's happening with gender, generative AI, I, I suspect that a lot of that will remain as human labor. In part because it is true that even with generative AI, while we are quickly seeing a moment at which we can anticipate well-written and interesting AI novels or screenplays, I'm not so sure how much people would be interested in them, to be frank. I think that part of what people get out of seeing a film or reading a novel or even reading a Substack article is that they are reading the perspective of a human agent. And that adds all kinds of value in the regard of social proof, in the regard that this is another member maybe of my community or my tribe that is processing the same information that I am. So I, I, I suspect that those parts of human labor will remain safe. The other parts that I think will remain safe are, again, the parts which involve truly difficult human insight or human thinking, creative thinking. So despite all the progress that has been made on building theorem provers, or building software programs that can make scientific discoveries and what have you, again, they are very frequently cycling simply through patterns of discovery that we can already know about and formalize. That way, it has to be something which can be absorbed by the computer and then repeated or generalized across new patterns of data. But the part where you tackle truly novel problems or novel challenges, which have not yet been formalized, people do still do things like invent new logical operators, invent new mathematical operations. Those kinds of techniques, I think it's hard to imagine a computer ever being able to, to take those away without overcoming a lot of the challenges with abductive reasoning. The last part I'll mention is that if you look at all these layoffs, which people are seeing regarding AI, it is true that AI can create a very good first draft of most common tasks. If a task is something which has been robustly described online and which is the kind of thing which many people seem to encounter, In other words, if you see a task that has 500 responses on Stack Overflow, then an AI will probably have found most of the good answers because <laughs> it's already out there, right? So it's simply saving you the trouble of having to go find it for yourself. 
But the point is, is that while an AI might be able to generate uh, an awful lot of code or a might be able to generate an email or a piece of content marketing rather quickly, the other part which we all seem to recognize is that because these AIs, at least for now, still seem to make an awful lot of mistakes, uh, they will frequently need a human editor. So what does that mean? That means that when software engineers use AI tools to create new pieces of software, while they're frequently able to generate a lot of boilerplate script, to customize that or to debug it or to tweak it to the exact outcome you're looking for requires quite a bit of nuanced understanding. And the challenge there is, is that the understanding you have to have to edit something long and complicated usually requires a lot of experience. It's more prestigious and in some ways requires more years of experience to be the editor of a paper or a magazine. And that's not by accident. It's because you have to have consumed a lot of that content in order to do that job well. So the difficulty that I see us encountering is that that may not leave a lot of easy room for junior writers or junior developers or junior designers. Rather, these people which have the requisite seniority to edit the content marketing that's spit out by the GPT powered tool or that are able to debug the code or see quickly where a majority of the code fits and yet it needs to be adjusted on these few lines or these variables ought to be renamed. Those senior positions will remain, but they require a high level of expert expertise, which may be difficult to acquire in a professional setting since AI will do a lot of that work. So the question will be, does the AI, does the, the coding boot camp or does the, the few writers that still have those editing skills, does it end up becoming a much smaller pool of much more experienced performers than it being a traditional sort of junior, middle, senior, climb your way up the ladder? I think it takes the bottom three rungs out of a four rung ladder um, or four, five, 10 rung ladder. It takes the bottom rungs out from a labor perspective. So I think the, the requisite knowledge to break into a new role or a new field might end up becoming a lot higher in some of those regards. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, um, sharing your point of view. Um... What are your thoughts there, Thomas? What's, what has been your opinion regarding all this? I mean, you also, as the audience may know, have a career in music and how you see this impacting your work. Will there be AI voices that are interviewing me at the next podcast? Uh, well, funny thing, we're, we're very into... Um having an assistant, like, like a lot of people now that we have, uh, um, uh, like the, the API open AI whisper, for example, which does a very good job at recognizing voices, um, using all this new tool, there are so many things very useful that can really enhance our skills on a daily basis. So, so this is something we, <laughs> so not, not interviewing, um, uh, the next time you come on the show, uh, I hope uh, I will still be there and um, no uh, AI assistant will replace me uh, <laughs> at that task. Regarding the music, uh, I feel like it is very related to what you mentioned before. What people look for in an artist um, is uh, the human behind and the values and the message and the art in its uh, interior form, um, having the perspective and vision of the artist. So I think a lot of people are going to use those tools to like write lyrics faster or find better lyrics. So I think it will um, 
it will increase um, the barrel, but I feel like using those new tools will just increase in productivity and increase in in content generation, but it will not it will not increase in terms of talented people. And I think it is it, it applies to music and also to uh, all the fields like tech fields like um, AI can write code, but like write very very good efficient codes. So far, it is harder. And so I, I w my point would be that um, even though those tools are available for everyone and it is very easy to take on them, it is not that easy to be uh, this uh, famous thing lately on LinkedIn, like the prompt, like using very well these tools is hard because to use them very well, to write a book with those tools, from my point of view, you need to know very well what you want to do and to know very well what you want to do. And it is related to what you specify in this podcast. You need to have this experience and this vision. So I, I'm like yourself. I am worried about all your, uh, those uh, junior positions um, because people will be able to achieve a lot more. But I would also think that if a senior grows faster, I think there is always place for a junior to learn to take on the senior, uh, and I think if we have if we are being conscious of this um, problem, we'll find ways to solve it. Because at some point, if we don't recruit juniors and we don't form them, um, it will be hard to grow teams and to show perspective to your to your teams. Uh, so I think. I think we'll see a lot of uh, good things and bad things in the future, um, generally speaking. Um, but I think we'll need to find innovative ways to deal with those and trying to minimize the impact that it will have, the negative impact, impact let's say. Mm, so I think, yeah, I think this would be my point of view. Thank <laughs> you for, uh, for asking. I generally don't uh, uh, share a lot of my own perspective on the podcast, but... Um, but um, yeah, I think this is what uh, what I would say. And so to um, to uh, I mean, would you have a thing that you would like to uh, give your perspective based on what I just said? I I would say that I think you're absolutely right that the there has to be a way to contend with the problem because there are still going to be the same amount of people on earth in the same ballpark figure, at least over the next five or 10 years. And as this AI becomes a part of our daily working lives, those people have to go somewhere, right? And so all said, of course, it may be the case that younger or junior people entering the workforce that learn how to use these AI tools from the ground up may actually end up displacing more senior people who don't know how to use the tools as well. Uh, we, that will be yet to be seen, I think. Again, I, I, do, think, I do think there is a, a challenge with how, to you, how do you get all of the same amount of information or learning that you would normally have by rising from being a junior to a mid-level to a senior engineer. But perhaps that won't be so necessary as knowledge any, anymore. It reminds me of a paraphrase I'm making now of, of Bill Gates, who, who discussed about how one of the advantages, and I could be wrong, I'm fairly sure this was Gates, who discussed how one of the advantages he had as a young entrepreneur in the computer revolution, a younger computer engineer, is that they actually had to contend with problems relating to hardware in a way that a lot of modern day developers do not have to. They, the, the difficulties of contending with space and memory were much more challenging when you were trying to build enterprise software using lower level languages than we do today. Today, the average developer 
can take for granted that 99% of projects he writes using a high level programming language are never really going to run into issues of cost or performance. And so they don't have to be mindful of writing efficient algorithms, or they don't have to be mindful of O notation in the way that a engineer in the past did. So the question I think I have, and the point is that, you know, Bill Gates was really saying this as something of a lament that mm -hmm. it's a, it's a bummer that more engineers today aren't familiar with that problem space. But the question of course is, well, it doesn't, that doesn't seem to have really stopped anybody. It's not as if that seems to have slowed any innovation. I'm sure there are many programs out there that could be more efficient if engineers were learning those principles, but it hasn't seemed to slow the pace at which we've been able to build things. And if there's a whole generation of engineers that does not need to know a lot of the things that AI automates away for them, perhaps that's okay. <laughs> perhaps again, that falls into the bucket of, of computation and other things that are beneath us. Hmm. Indeed. I could go on for so long. <laughs> I could, <laughs> this is, um, so, so, uh, I think, I think we could, um, discuss, uh, I'm thinking I have a lot of ideas of what, uh, I could, uh, ask you based on what we've said on this episode and and add more things just based on what you said but i think uh i think this gives a very global idea of uh, one perspective of ai which as tr uh, i truly relate to um so regarding this the, the i feel like people that will have um a very Uh, we'll always have a place in, in like finding jobs and in, in building things. You mentioned superpower, like when you can build tools, end-to-end -end tools, uh, you, you kind of have a superpower. I feel like people who are, who have like a passion kind of, and like are very curious about not doing one thing well, but like how the ecosystem works and and being curious about all kinds of projects will never struggle to to fit into the market um, and, and find jobs because they will easily, if needed, go back to a lower type of code. Like not big, maybe they've, they're, they started with Python, but because they have this curiosity and then they go on an Arduino and they go into robotics and they understand, I don't know, they look into the Boston dynamic works and they're like, wow, uh, I have cool ideas of what I can do with Python and, and my vision of database and how I use cloud, cloud platforms, but I would like to implement it in robots, but in robots, I need to code in C and, um, and I don't know, I'll get myself an Arduino and, and, And so I think if someone has this passion and curiosity of understanding things with no fear to go like into like new stuff, uh, even if it have been made a long time ago and, and today not that many people are doing it um, that much, I feel like this way of doing things uh, will never face this kind of problems that we're discussing speaking specifically in the tech field i don't want to to say because then if we talk about like all kind of jobs we, we we could include like new economic models where like if ai replaced your job you can have a specific aid uh, you can have a specific minimum salary and this could be a global thing this have a name which i am not sure i remember perfectly um so i just wanted to to to, to add this um this to the to the table Um, do you want to, to add something uh, on top of that? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, there's no doubt that some jobs will be impacted by AI. I, I wouldn't be worried about anyone that was riding the wave in terms of continuing to enhance their skills by, by incorporating these tools into their workflow. 
I think all of those folks will be fine. If this is not for you, then there has not really been much of a revolution in technology which has not created more jobs than it has displaced. It's, it's hard to point at a single moment in all of the history of, of technology, modern history of technology, where we see people being outright worse off because, because new technologies have, have replaced jobs. It, it has always seemed the case that inevitably with new technologies, we also see new jobs being created. We're seeing it happening in real time. Prompt engineers are now all the rage. Obviously, we've talked about some of the issues regarding identity verification, protecting creative ideas, and other of the circumstances which are arising with these new tools. And inevitably, those will also create new jobs, new opportunities. So I think it's if if you <laughs> in the 21st century where technology is moving as fast as it is. It's simply going to be part of our experience. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks. I want. I have uh, three little questions uh, that that all, that we always do here at the on the show. Um, if that's all right with you. Uh, the first one being uh, briefly: How do you keep um, learning and staying on the edge of the latest advancement? Advancement. Sorry. Uh, can, can you give to the people who are listening, who are interested in what you do, how do you do, um, how do you keep learning? If you try and stay on the cutting edge of these technologies, I think the best place to look right now, as some people have already begun to realize, is probably the open source community. The open source community is, is moving very fast on AI. And so if you are already on GitHub, then you can look at which libraries are trending. If you want to see if you're more of a product or a marketing person, a lot of these new tools are making their appearance first on places like Product Hunt, Hacker News. These have been sort of reliable insider information resources for people working in startups, uh, Hacker News, Product Hunt, and what's trending on GitHub. Uh, so those are all those places that it's a good idea to keep your, your, your finger on the pulse. In terms of upskilling yourself, <laughs> as I was mentioning before, uh, I'm a little bit old school in my, my opinion that I don't think it's possible to really beat the information density of well-written books. I think as much as people enjoy podcasts and have been able to learn to code from things like YouTube videos, you can simply read better or, or more quickly than you can speak. So obviously people speak more slowly than they can read and more, you know, the, the best books of course have usually been through great publishers like Manning that have been marvelously edited And so in terms of how you consume information, keep up to date with these tools, I like to, to keep my eye on a lot of the new publications coming out of the prominent engineering publishers like Pact, Manning, O'Reilly. Uh, whatever they're drawing their attention to, it's probably a good idea to at least keep an eye on those resources as well. So that's certainly how I tend to upskill personally if I'm trying to learn a new tool. But part of the reading has to be interactive. The, the beauty of software engineering that is so special, of course, is you can learn and get better in real time by testing your ideas and testing your understanding. If you are a chemist or a physicist or an astronomer, then you do not get nearly so many opportunities to test your ideas and test your understanding as we get to in software engineering. And that's also part of why machine learning programs, of course, are, are becoming so good is because they can iteratively improve. So that's something that's accessible to you as well, so long as you got to keep a uh, terminal open while you're consuming those resources and get your hands dirty. Get your hands dirty. Awesome. Uh, second last question, uh, and there are three of them. 
how can people look into your work, uh, into into you, and you write papers? Uh, how can people uh, learn more from you and maybe reach out to you? Of course, I'm uh, available at williamjlittlefield.com. As as everyone has heard, Thomas here has been calling me Billy. We're good friends, and so uh, that's that's always been my my uh, my preferred name, but. William has usually been what I, I put in print. And you can find me at WJ Littlefield2 on Twitter. And last but not least, you can follow us at Wisest, where we're building a new kind of investment trading platform. In terms of my publications, those are usually mentioned on my website and on my link tree. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, last question, and before stating this last question, thanks a lot, uh, Billy, to come on the show, uh, for coming on the show, sorry. Um, that have been a very, very interesting episode. I'm super interested in uh, having your opinion on, on, on this episode. Let us know in the comments. Um, and uh, we would love to answer some any kind of questions in the comments, of course. Uh, you can also reach out directly on LinkedIn. Um, so my last question, Billy, is would you have a message for the Let's Talk AI community? It can be personal and it can be professional. Would you have a message for us? <laughs> I'll leave the community with one of my favorite quotes uh, regarding this debate about creativity, AI, and the role that reasoning and, and human creativity play. It's from Gian Battista Vico, who said, imagination is strong as reasoning power is weak. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks again for all uh, the information you shared in, in this episode. Uh, I look forward to, to speak again soon. And I wish you to have a wonderful day. <laughs> you too, Thomas. Cheers.